want to welcome every single person that came today. Excited to have you. And I have a brief message I'd love to share with you just to remind us of what the season really is about. Before we do that, though, I want to do something new. We've never done this at our church. We decided to do that this Christmas. Uh, at your seat at both our locations, when you came in, was a Christmas survey card. I would like for every person to get it out right now. You probably threw it under your seat or by your seat. There's a pen there. I want every person to get this out. Whether this is your first time here at the X or whether you're a regular, I want every person to fill this out. Doesn't matter if you call pastor your dad, you're gonna fill it out, okay? It doesn't matter. I want you to begin to fill it out. And here's why, because listen, our church, we really believe in being a church for the community. And so in order for us to do that, we would love to know what's, what's on your heart. We want to engage with the community. And so if you wouldn't mind, just take a moment, begin to fill that out right now, just your name. Listen, we want to know your age, okay? Don't worry, we're not going to advertise this. We're not going to put you on a list and spam you. But, but it's helpful for us to know, hey, your age, these are the things you're wrestling with. And we as a church want to speak to those things that are going on. And so I, I, there's a personal reason why I wanted to do this, and I want to walk you through this first page. We're just going to go through the front of it right now. And, and we have a few questions on here we would love to just know. This helps us understand and know our community. The first one is this. You'll see it says, favorite style of music. So if you're one of those people who say, yeehaw, you're going to check country. Now, here's the thing. You're only going to pick one. And every time you're like, ah, oh, ah, oh. that's why it says favorite. Okay? If you're a, if you're a Swifty, okay, you'll, you'll select pop. If you're really saved, you'll select rock. Rock and roll. I do that for the religious people. They get mad. Uh, if you like hip-hop, Kanye, gosh, his album is so hot. Jesus is king. If you haven't heard it, it's good. I'm telling you. we got to figure out how to get that into church here. Uh, maybe it's Christian contemporary. If that's worship, whatever. We would love if you pick your favorite style of music. Next question on here is this. What are your most significant stressors? Like, like when you think about life right now, what are you stressed about? It could be school. If you're a student, you're like, uh, math class. That, I don't know if I'm going to pass, okay? It, it could be your financial situation. It could be your marriage. It could be, a, uh, it could be your situation at work. What is stressing you out? We would love to know what that is. And also, this helps us know as a staff, we'd love to be able to pray for you. How, how would you like to have some people maybe at a church that you don't even attend praying for whatever you have going on in your life? So these are the, the stresses in your life. And then this question at the bottom says this, what topics interest you the most? Now, obviously, these are not just general topics, but if you were to say, if, if a church would speak to something today in my world, my life, this is the topic I would love to have the church speak about. And so I would love you to choose maybe just one or two of those. Uh, maybe you, your, your finances are a mess, okay, and you're like, I could use some help, all right? Maybe it's that. Maybe it's your marriage, dating. Maybe it is you're worried about heaven or hell and eternity. Maybe it's racism, diversity, science in the Bible. Pick something else. Just We would love to know what is going on in your world so as a church community that we can reach you in your world and speak to things that you're going on. Would that be good? Come on, I think that'd be awesome. By the way, I'm going to take some of the things that you guys select, the top ones, and I'm going to make them some of our conversations that we're going to be talking about in 2020 here at this church. And so this is an opportunity for you to kind of, to kind of direct kind of the direction that we go and what we speak to, all right? And so listen, I know you got the front of it done. You don't have to worry about the back. Here's what I want every single person to do now. I want you to take your pen and I want you to click it so it's off, okay? And then I want you to take your survey card and stick it under your seat, okay? Go ahead and do that right now because I want to share a few things and I don't need you doodling and I don't need you filling out and working ahead. I know I got some of you type A people and you're like, I got to work ahead. Don't do that. Okay, I just, I want your attention for just a few minutes. Because Christmas season is already busy enough, it's hard for us to sometimes pause for just a little bit and reflect on really the reason for the season. And so that's what I love. That's why I think this is so important. And I don't know what you expected when you came to church here. Maybe it's your first time and you're like, uh, this isn't church. You know, I get that. We hear that a lot. It's really loud. I get that. We hear that a lot. Um, I understand sometimes you don't know what to expect in life. You know, the same is so true if you think about the Christmas story. When I think about the Christmas story, and I know so many of us, we've got this picture in our minds of the Christmas story, whether you go to church or not. 
And, and because you've heard it so many times, we, we play it in just our community and our culture. You, you've watched the Charlie Brown special, so you know all about the Christmas story. And, and we have this, this picture of what it was, and I love, it's my favorite thing to do at Christmas time, I love to remind us all of what the Christmas story was really like. Like, like, like think about Mary, this, this teenage girl that finds out all of a sudden that she's going to be expecting with a child, though she doesn't have a man in that regard. Let me think about it for just a moment. I know a lot of you are parents. How many of you are parents? Raise your hand if you're a parent, okay? A lot of parents here today, I'm sure. Uh, think back to the time when you found out you were expecting your first child. I remember the moment. I can remember it like it was yesterday when my, mo- my wife and I found out we we're pregnant. More her than me, but we, we, it's, it's a two-person thing, really, usually. And, uh, and, and I remember finding that out. And, and it's exciting, but it's also scary, right, moms? That's the first time, remember that. It's exciting, but it's scary because you don't know what to expect. And I remember that, that we got this book. I, I brought it with me. It's called What to Expect When You're Expecting. Let me just ask real quick. How many of you have read this book or parts of this book? Raise your hand if you have. I have not met anybody that's ever been pregnant that has not read some of this book. If you haven't, you should get it, because it even says on the back, it's America's Pregnancy Bible. (laughs) This is like your Bible, okay, if you're pregnant. And I remember that we had this book when we found out that we were pregnant with our first daughter. And um, I I was thumbing through this book. Let me just warn you, though, you will learn more than you ever wanted to know about the female body if you read through this book. So just be careful, okay? And, 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 and so I was thinking about the whole season leading up to the birth of our first daughter and, and the excitement and, and how we had this so we could know what to expect. But then I'm trying to think about Mary and her situation and how times were so different back then and, and how she found out and how she didn't really. I mean, it, it, like, can you imagine it was not only unplanned, but it was unexpected. I wonder if someone could have written Mary a book much like this, it would have said, what to expect when you're expecting the Son of God. Now that would have been a helpful book, right? I mean, I just just think about it. The whole entire Christmas story, to be honest, as I think about it, nothing happens the way you would expect. I mean, how would you expect the creator of the world to step into his creation? How do you think it would go? None of it happens like, like we expect it would. I mean, just picture it begins with this teenage daughter, this teenage girl who's a virgin, her name's Mary, and she, and she really comes from very poor background. She lives in a town that is just really insignificant. And imagine that here she is, she's engaged. I know most of you know this story. She's engaged to Joseph. Like, I, I just picture what it was like. I remember when I was engaged and we're planning our future. Most of you can think about that. You've got dreams and aspirations and plans and how they were going to get a little apartment on the south side of Nazareth and how one day they were going to have family, but they were going to first take the first year, few years just to each other, maybe their honeymoon, sailing on the Sea of Galilee. I don't know what it was going to be, but all these dreams that they have, and they all change in a moment. I imagine it's, it's just Tuesday. She's in her house, and she's just doing some normal normal things around the house, when Luke records for us that an angel, not just any angel, but we know his name was Gabriel, an angel appears to her out of nowhere, just boom, shows up in the room. I don't know what it was like. I'll be honest with you. I don't think I've ever seen an angel. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever maybe wondered if you've seen an angel. I've always pictured what's it like. Did he have big wings? Was he glowing? Did he have a halo? I don't know. but, But here's this angel that just shows up in the middle of this moment, And he says to Mary, he says, Mary, shockingly enough, he knows her name, says, God's impressed with you. What? Yeah. God's God's impressed with you. And she's freaking out. You would have been too. Scared to death. What's this guy going to do to me? And I I wanted to read to you just a little bit from the actual story. We hear so much of it in the movies. But but how did the story actually go in Luke chapter 1? And here's what the angel says in verse 30. He said, don't be afraid, Mary. The angel told her, for you have found favor with God. 
He said, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Can you imagine an angel giving you this kind of news? Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I'm a virgin. I know that's the part of the story as parents we just kind of gloss over with our kids when we tell them the Christmas story. Then it says, the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you so that the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, I think, in a way, most of us are so familiar with this story. I mean, we've heard it since we were kids. That a lot of times we have sterilized it from what it was really like. And let me ask you a question. If you were going to write the narrative for how the God who spoke the heavens into existence, the God who formed the earth that we're on, the God that created the galaxies, if you were going to write a story where that God stepped down into our experience, my guess is this is not how you would write it. We wouldn't write it like this. When you think about the story, there's so little of this entire story that goes the way you would expect it to go if God stepped into our experience. And we're so familiar with it, but, but when you think about it, that the, this teenage girl in an insignificant town, Nazareth. Nazareth was a poor town. It was a town where they had Roman garrisons, and, and it was actually like, it was just considered to be kind of one of those outskirt towns that nobody ever thinks about. You think about how the news of this gets delivered that God speaks through an angel directly to Mary and Joseph. Do you know that was not the MO for how God spoke to his people? Up until that point, God spoke through religious people and through prophets. And now it's all different. And then Caesar Augustus orders a decree that, that they all have to take the census. That hasn't happened in forever. And so imagine in their third trimester that Joseph and Mary now have to travel by donkey all the way down to Bethlehem because that's where he's from. And then when they get there, because it's a census, there's no room in the hotel. Everything is booked. And so they're left to go to some outdoor cave or shelter where shepherds would normally take sheep and they would take them at night. And so, uh, listen, we have these pretty nativity scenes set up at our homes. But can I just tell you, that's not what it was like. It wasn't a pretty little sight. Do you know what doesn't come with your nativity scene? The smell. It stunk in there. I've never seen a nativity scene that gives you a little bit of dung to put right with all the sheep. And uh, that, that'll a little bit more accurate. That's what they should do. And imagine they're sitting in this cave and it's cold and they can't even be in a room. And all of a sudden she looks over and says to Joe, uh-oh, I think my water just broke. This is really how it went down. And then all of a sudden, the contractions started getting closer and closer together. These aren't Braxton Hicks. These are real contractions. And they're now three minutes apart. And Joe's freaking out. She's like, I, got, I don't have to push. And he's like, what are you talking? Don't push. Don't push. I got to find that. Where are you going to find a doctor at this hour? At the, you're going to have to deliver the baby. I can't deliver the baby. No, you're going to have to deliver. Can you imagine that moment? I know it's so pretty and it's so cute and it's in our pageants and our plays. But listen, this is how it really went. And then the baby is born, and it's messy. They don't have anything for him, and they wrap him up in just whatever. They've got a cloth, and it's like, where are we going to put him? It's dirty. It's not. Okay, we'll put him in the feeding trough. Can I ask you a question? Like, if you were going to write the story for how the creator came down to this earth and his creation, is this how you'd write it? No. See, nothing that happened was what was expected. Think about the creator came to be cared for by his creation. That's strange. That God would step into our experience, but listen, as a vulnerable baby that has to be cared for by one of the poorest families in town. Huh? It's the ultimate riches to rags story. Do we ever think of it that way? It, it, it's, it's so unexpected that, get this, that people missed it. It's amazing that all across this world today that we all celebrate the story. But when it actually happened, it was missed. 
His own people did not come rushing to see. The only ones that visited him there were the shepherds because they were told by the angels. No, no one shows up to, to, to celebrate the creator coming as a baby. And yet, here's what's amazing about that time, and if you don't know the history and the context, let me just tell you that the people of Israel were actually expecting and hoping God would do something. If you don't know what happened in history, the nation of Israel had actually been living under Roman oppression and rule. They had not been a real nation for very long. It had been hundreds of years since they had heard anything from God through a prophet. Oh, and, and they're waiting and expecting God, will you show up and do something? In the middle of their pain-filled world, they wanted God to show up, and yet they missed it because he didn't come the way they expected. They even had prophecies. Do you know this? They had, they had prophecies from their Old Testament. That's what we call it, but they're scriptures that were given hundreds of years before Jesus came that he fulfilled every single one of them. There were prophecies. Now, these are the things that they held on to. This was the only hope that they had, that one time God would show up and he would do something. And he said that, that the one, the Messiah would come and come from the family, the tradition, the line of David. Guess what family line Joseph came from? David, that's why he had to go to Bethlehem during the census. Oh, by the way, prophet Micah said that the Messiah that would come would be born in Bethlehem. Oh my gosh, it worked. Another prophet, Isaiah, said that, that the Messiah would be born to a virgin. That these are all things that they were holding on to. And then get this, when it happened, they missed it. Because the way they pictured God stepping into their situation was so different than the way it really happened. They not only missed the baby Jesus, they also missed the other version of Jesus. They didn't just miss the Christmas version. They missed Jesus altogether. It wasn't just Christmas they missed, but when he grew up and began in ministry, do you know his own hometown, Nazareth? I mean, here he is. He was doing miracles, and they were like, well, no, you're the carpenter's son. You, you're just a carpenter. You can't. No, this doesn't work. This doesn't make sense. It wasn't what they expected. You know his own family, his brothers? Sister, you know that they didn't believe in him? They thought he was crazy. No, no, they all missed it because, because they didn't expect God to show up that way. And if Christmas would tell us anything, and there's something that I think applies to each and one of us, and that is this, that which is not expected is often not accepted. Think about it in your life. That which is not expected is often not accepted. When you think about your life, I wonder if there are things that have happened in your lifetime that you didn't expect. I know it's been true in my life. I think all of us would say yeah. There are things that happen in our world that we just never expected to happen. And oftentimes, let me say this, that when those things happen in our life, you know where, like Mary, we had dreams, we had plans, and they did not happen the way we thought they would. We thought we'd be further along than where we really are. We didn't think we were going to struggle with this addiction like we did. We, when we have all of these pictures, these dreams of what it was going to be, and then it doesn't turn out the way it is, can I just tell you what happens? We often tend to silently get mad at God. I don't know if some of you, life did not turn out the way you expected. Maybe you thought, I never anticipated being alone at this age. Or I, I never, never expected I, I, I would have a child that I had to raise that had such challenges. I never expected to be in this financial situation. I never expected our marriage would be this difficult. I, I never expected that I was going to lose my job and then we'd lose our house. I never expected to be dealing with this kind of pain in my body. So many of us have gone through so many things that's not how we expected our life to go. And here's what we do. We tend to respond one of two ways toward God. We either get angry at him or we stop believing in him. Some of you, no one else knows this, so let's just be between you and me. But you're here and you're celebrating Christmas, but the truth is inside you're either angry at God or you stopped believing in him a long time ago. By the way, you can't do both. You can't not believe in God and be angry at him. And so I just want, 
want to speak to that because I, I know that some of you are here today this Christmas and we're supposed to be all full of Christmas cheer and we're supposed to celebrate the birth of Jesus. But the truth is some of you feel like God has let you down. Some of you feel like um, that God didn't show up when you wanted him to. Things you begged him to do to keep your parents together, to keep your marriage together, to keep that person from dying. That you begged and you pleaded and you prayed for and God didn't show up and so you've been let down. And so kind of in the back of your, your heart, you kind of have kept a little distance from him. You've kind of pushed away a little bit from him. And every Christmas you celebrate, but you don't ever really let yourself go to that place. And, and yet I, I wonder if even right now in this moment, both here in Lancaster, that, that you're sensing that there's something inside of you that's pulling you back toward God. Can I tell you, I believe that the Spirit of God is here right now. And he's pulling you back toward him. Because you feel like that God didn't show up. But the truth is, God maybe has shown up many ways in your life. But it wasn't how you expected. And you missed him. If I could just say this to you. Right now in this moment, don't miss this moment with God. We have a tendency sometimes to be in an environment like this. And we feel something stirring in our heart. And then we kind of push it down. And we kind of, we kind of like, because we're afraid and we kind of push back from it. Can I just encourage you, don't, don't do that because God wants to do something in your life today and he wants to show you himself. And some of you um, have gone through a lot of pain and because of it, you've just kind of pushed, pushed back away and, and you said, okay, God, if you're really there, then, then I need a sign. I need you to do something big. For if I'm going to believe in you again. I, I need, like, like it's got to be some miraculous moment. Maybe, you know, you write my name in the clouds, then I'll believe. It's got to be something huge. If there's anything the Christmas story should tell us, is that if you're looking for God to do something huge, you might miss him. Because he tends to show up in the small, insignificant ways that we so easily miss every day in our lives. It's so easy to miss like they missed Jesus in the first Christmas. It's easy for us to miss because we're waiting for God to do something big in our lives. Maybe some of you have been waiting for God to do something and he has been trying for so long to do something in your life. Maybe there have been moments in your life that you just, you didn't even realize it was a God moment. Moments when, when your kid was saying, I, I want to I go to church, but you kind of just Push them kind of like, oh, no, not, not right now, because you don't want to confront your disappointments with God. Or maybe a moment where you got in a really bad accident. I've talked to people like this that you walked away from, and you said, there's no way I should have walked away from that. I guess something's looking out for me. Could that be God? God was showing up in a moment. I don't know what kind of moments that maybe you've had in your life that you just kind of said it's coincidence. I personally don't believe in coincidence. I believe in a God who reigns over this world that loves and cares so deeply and passionately for you and me that he's constantly trying to show up in small ways and we're expecting something else. And you can have a tendency to miss it. I just wonder... Are some of you waiting on God to do something he's already done? Are you waiting for God to show up in a way that he already has? Well, if I get a sign, hey, what about that person at work that's been inviting you over and over and you just kind of keep blowing them off because you think they're annoying? How do you not know that that's been God over and over trying to say, come on, I want to reconnect with you. I want to reconnect you. When things haven't gone the way you planned, it could be that God's trying to say, stop trying to do this on your own. I want you to come to me. Is it possible that God's, God's been trying to connect with you? I just want to say, I believe right now, in this moment, that, that God's stirring some of your hearts in a new way, a fresh way. And he's wanting to connect with you and he's wanting to to meet with you right now in this moment. It's so easy to miss a moment like this because I'm looking for something else. If you just look at the story of Christmas, what you're gonna see is that God showed up in ways no one expected to do something for you and me 
And here's the thing, the reason why so many of us at this church and the reason why so many of us believe in Jesus is not because he was just born, but because he died and rose again. If you want to know what my faith is founded on, it's not Christmas. I love Christmas, don't get me wrong. But it's what happened to Easter when Jesus went to the cross to pay a sinner's death that he did not deserve, but I deserved. So that he could give me grace, so that he could make a way for me to the Father. And then when God raised him from the dead on the third day, I know you didn't come to hear something about Easter, but I can't talk about Jesus without talking about the thing that matters the most in my life, which is the fact that Jesus is alive. And ever since that moment when I've connected with God through Jesus, it's changed my life. It's given me hope. It's given me grace. It's given me a reason to look for God in my life. And if you look for him, he is all around. He's all around us. And he's in this moment right now. And he's drawing some of you to say, it's time. It's time to come home to the Father.